Hello, I'm Norm Rasmussen, the founder of the Precious Testimonies Outreach Ministry. We'll be playing a, a testimony here about a, a gal who grew up believing that she was a boy. And this is becoming an issue more and more that humanity is having to deal with. And so after this testimony, I feel to make some commentary about it. And so uh, let's listen to the testimony now. And if you're so inclined to hear what I feel the Holy Spirit would have me share about it, then so be it. God bless. My name is Tiara Moore, and I'm from the east side of Detroit. I was born and raised on that side of town, and I went to a Catholic school. Growing up, it seemed like I was just a regular child, but in kindergarten, I knew something was different about me. I knew something was strange about me. I began to like what I saw. I started liking the same sex. And so I remember in kindergarten, I used to tell my childhood friend that I was a boy. I used to tell her that my parents didn't know it because I had a crush on her. And even being that young, I knew it was wrong because my parents were taking me to church. But still, I liked what I liked. And so today I can understand how people could think that they were born that way because in kindergarten, you're so young. And a lot of people believe that when you're that young, you don't deal with demons. You don't have thoughts like that because when you're youthful and when you're a little child, you're considered pure. But the reality is, is that we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And so out of the womb, I was a sinner. And so as I began to get older, going to high school, I actually began to act on it. But before I began to act on it, I had relationships over the phone. So it went from internet to now telephone. Dating guys as a cover up. I never really were into them, never really liked them, was barely attracted to them. It was something I just did not like. I did not like men at all. I dated, I had boyfriends, I brought them around my family just to seem normal because I wasn't normal. And I can even remember even as a child, not to jump around, but I would even pray and I would ask God to take this away from me, but he didn't. I'm thinking to myself that that was how God made me and that's how I was supposed to stay because he didn't take it away. And even with that, my mom used to teach us how to pray. And she said, listen to your first thought. So my first thought was, I'm going downstairs. And downstairs in the little child's mind is hell. I would say, God, I don't want to go downstairs. That was my main prayer. And so in high school, I began to get in a relationship. And in that relationship, it was my first real interaction with a woman. And I thought that I had fallen in love. I knew that it was wrong in my heart. But then I began to justify it. But then I began to know it was wrong. So I'm wrestling. And I can understand why people can be what we run away from in church, which is, which is kind of like bipolar. You're dealing with two different personalities. And I'm creating this person on the inside of me. And so now I'm entangled with two people. And so I'm still trying to be regular. I'm still trying to be normal. But I'm totally in love with the woman. And so from there, I'm having encounters. You know, I'm, I'm actually being intimate. I was a virgin towards a guy but I lost my virginity to a woman. And I didn't even know why, because me and this person didn't even like each other. But then that next year, we loved each other and we loved very hard. I started to pick up different ways and I started to pick up different attributes. I started to steal like her. I started to lie like her. I started to drink like her. I started to smoke like her, I started to be like her, 
to the point where I said, you know, I smell like you. Because that's how close we began to be. And we began to play house. I would be in her basement, she would go to work, I will be in the bed. And when we were done being intimate, I just felt such a wicked presence that I knew it wasn't God. It, the lights would be completely off and I would lay in that bed and I would be afraid for my life, but I just couldn't stop doing what I was doing. I felt a demonic presence, but I still couldn't change because I was so in love. Further on, graduating from high school, I walk into college. And so it gets worse instead of getting better. I ended up accepting a ring to the point where if it had not been for God, I believe I would be in Arizona married to a woman because I began to accept that this is my life. And so in my mind, I'm writing letters to my parents, apologizing that my dad wouldn't be able to walk his baby girl down the aisle to a man, apologizing that my mother would never be a grandmother because I was in love with a woman. There's no way I can reproduce from that relationship. And so from there, something happened. It was a shaking. I began to get more God conscious. I began to get more afraid of hell. I was terrified. I always, it felt like I was always in the cold because now that I'm in this place, I realized that I didn't have life. I was a walking dead woman. And so it began to pull me down even further and further. And so another woman stepped in the picture. And the thing about that lifestyle is that the deeper you go, the worse you get. It doesn't get better. It looks like it's fun. It looks like people are happy, but you honestly get worse. There's no true love in it. It's a road of heartbreak, disappointments, and ultimately suicide, but eternally damnation. And so being with this woman and being in college, my life is changing for the worse. I'm absolutely going crazy. I'm coming out to people thinking that I'm doing something good. I'm telling them I'm gay. I'm starting to get prideful about it and accept that this is me, but God didn't allow me to get too far. And then one day, I'm laying down and I go back to Marvin Sapp. He saw the best in me. And then I made a decision. I said, Lord, I need to get saved. I gotta get saved because my life is falling in shambles. I wanna kill myself. I'm living a double life. I'm sneaking people into my mother's house. I'm being disrespectful. I'm liking women. I'm torn. I gotta get saved. I, I gotta let this go. It was hard to let it go, but I'm like, I gotta let this go. And God kept on, every time I asked, why is this happening? The only thing that will come in my mind was that prayer. That's the only thing that kept coming into my mind was I said I was tired. And so that Saturday, I stayed up all night because I was excited. I felt it. I was excited. I said, man, when they open up them church doors, I'm going down there. I was excited. I was so excited that I literally stayed up to about 6 o'clock. And without an alarm clock, I woke up at 8. I woke up like I had slept a full eight hours. Something was happening to me. Something was coming. Something, it was a change. Something was happening. And so I get up. I asked my friend, I said, what time did church start? She said, 9 o'clock. She gave me the wrong time. So I went in right when the pastor was opening up the doors for the church. And I heard a little bit of the end of the message to the point where I can't even tell you what he preached about. All I knew was that when those doors opened, those doors were open for me. And so when I walked, when he opened up the doors and asked, does anyone want to be saved and give their life to Jesus? All I know was that my body lifted up and my body turned as if somebody was instructing me how to get up and how to turn and my feet just moved. It moved and it was a long walk because I sat at the side of the church, but my body, I just knew. And I got up and I walked around and I made it to the front of the church and I just broke down. And from there, my life has never been the same. Things have come at me. Things have tried to try me, but when I say that God delivers, 
he delivers. And it's not a fake deliverance. He completely took the desire and the taste out of my mouth to the point where he put in natural affection. And that's how I know that when you are in Christ, old things are passed away and all things become new. He had mercy on me in the midst of the club. While I'm sitting there, he didn't have to say anything. But now I know for sure that it's not his will that man perish, but that all men come to repentance. And there is absolutely nowhere that God will not reach you. If I know that he had mercy on me in the club with a drink in my hand and told me that this is not who I am, then I know for sure that anybody practicing that lifestyle can come out and not be afraid that they won't like the opposite sex. That was another thing that kept me locked in. I was afraid that because I didn't like men, that I wouldn't like men. But God put that natural affection back in me to the point where when I look at a woman, that's my sister and that's it. That's all. There's no desire. And so I know that you could be truly delivered from a lifestyle of lesbianism. You can be delivered from a lifestyle of homosexuality. You can be delivered from perversion. No matter what type it is, even if you're dealing with a heterosexual couple and you just can't stop having sex, you just can't stop looking at pornography, you just can't stop being what you think is you, you can stop because that's really not who you are. And I know from experience that not only did he take me away from the lifestyle of being a lesbian, but he took me away and put his words in my mouth to preach the gospel. And that's how I know that there is purpose attached to anyone, no matter how far someone think that they are, no matter how deep, no matter where you're at, even if you're in prison, if the call is attached to your life, you gotta surrender because there's a purpose and there's another vessel for you to pour into all for God's glory to know that he is good. And so this is a victory testimony that homosexuality does not have to be your identity. No matter what you're in, no matter how deep, God can take you away from it. There's no such thing as being gay and being holy. There is no such thing as that. There's no such thing as being gay, holy, but you're not practicing it. There's no such thing that is deception. God will take you and really clean you and take it out of you because that's what he desires for you to be completely delivered with no residue. And so I know if he did it for me and if he did it for someone else, he can do it for anybody. And that is the truth of this reality is that God is a deliverer from whatever it is that you're caught into no matter how tight. No matter how much you think is you, he had changed you and give you purpose and put his word in you. And someone else can be blessed by what God has taken you from. He saw the best. He saw the best. Well, I hope that this testimony has blessed you in some special way. Um, very powerful, and I so appreciate Sister Moore making it available to go out on the Internet for God to use as he so wills. The most important thing that I feel God would have me share on this clip is to alert people to something that they may not be aware of. My question to you, are you living in ongoing sin? If you are, you are not positioning yourself to receive God's maximized favor, His maximized blessing, in this life. 
Many people live their entire lives never receiving God's maximized blessing, His maximized favor on their life. And that's tragic. I believe God says that's tragic. So if you get anything at all from what I'm about to share, please don't forget that. Ask that question frequently. Pray to God if you believe there's a God and ask God to reveal to you, am I living a life that is causing me to uh, not receive maximized blessing from God? It's an important question. I have to start by laying a foundation here. This is a topic that so many people don't want to hear. Well, only God can get people to hear it, so I'm trusting God that whoever's supposed to hear this will hear it. We have a battle of good and evil going on in the lives of people on this planet. None of us are exempt from being affected by this spiritual battle between good and evil. God, who is made up of God the Father, God the Son, or Jesus Christ, and then God the Holy Spirit, and His holy angels working on behalf of His will, is the good guys, and Satan and all the demons that are under His command and authority, they're the bad guys. All right? It's as simple as I know how to express it. And so demons have been allowed yet until God locks them away where they no longer can affect humanity. And that's not going to happen for a long time yet as of this filming. But it is recorded in the last book of the Bible and a few other places. Um, we have to deal with spirit beings that wants to influence our thinking. God wants to influence our thinking. Satan wants to influence our thinking. The demons that Satan assigns to us are to influence our thinking. We're in a battle in this life, and it takes place primarily right between our ears in our mind. God will not force us to believe what he wants us to believe. And that's called spiritual truth. He will not force that upon us. He gives us free will to seek it out. And if we truly want to know what spiritual truth is, in other words, truth that God says is truth, his truth, he will impart that to us as he decides it's needed. We truly believe he wants to impart it to us. Satan, knowing that God wants to impart his truth to us, does everything he can to keep us from seeking God's truth. And Satan learned a long time ago that probably the best strategy he can attempt to affect into the mind of us is to get us to believe his lies. He has a number of ways that works well for him for us to believe his lies. You can read about it, first book in the Bible, right at the very beginning in Genesis, where Adam and Eve were pure before God, but God gave them free will. Well, for free will to be tested, God has allowed Satan to enter into the human race to test us to see if we're going to be obedient to God and what God says is truth or and his commands or we're not. Well, we read about how Satan came in the form of a deceptive creature called a serpent, whatever that might fully mean, and he lied to Adam and Eve. He told them half-truths. God says, if you eat of this particular fruit, you're going to die. Satan came and said, if you eat that fruit, you're not going to die. Then he added a, a lie to it. And he says, God wants you to know the difference between good and evil. 
stuff. God wanted Adam and Eve to know the difference between good and evil. He would have given that to them without Satan showing up and trying to get them to believe that that was something worth taking the risk of eating of forbidden fruit. So Satan will lie to you, and then he's, he will twist it, and he will give you some enticements. He's got a myriad of ways to, to trap us into sinning against God. Adam and Eve sinned against God. They disobeyed what God said not to do. Okay? Called sin. Rebellion against God. You can say it that way as well. And so, that sin nature of theirs somehow got translated into the offspring of Adam and Eve. And the Bible tells us, the New Testament Bible tells us that we inherited Adam and Eve's sinful nature. We were born with a nature to rebel against God. We were born with a uh, nature to sometimes, in most cases, believe Satan's lies easier than we can believe God's truth. A lot could be said about that. I won't go there. Satan will never receive any favor or blessings from God, nor will the demons. God has pronounced judgment on them. There will only be eternal torment. And yet that will come in stages. And their worst torment will not be affected until God is done using them to test and try the human race. To see what we're going to do regarding spiritual truth. Let me just interject something here. I don't know if you've ever been exposed to this, but have you questioned why were you created? Why are you here on this planet? Why are you alive? Well, what's the purpose of it all? Well, I can tell you what the purpose of it is. To glorify God. The real God. The true God. The God who's the judge, who's going to determine our eternity. We were created to glorify Him. <clears throat> well, how do we do that? Well, in alignment with His truth. That is found in the New Testament Holy Bible. Alright? And... So Satan says, yep, I know all about that. That was really why I was created, and all the angels that got kicked out of heaven were created too, to glorify God. God created all angels initially to glorify him. That was their purpose, okay? And so Satan, and the Bible tells us, a third of the demons at that time, whenever, however long ago that was, they decided, no, we want to make our own decisions, and we just want God to bless them. We don't want to be punished for it. We just would like the independence of doing what we want to do and hope there are no consequences to that. That was her mindset. God said, didn't create you for that purpose. Don't need that. I run the show. I'm fully qualified to know what's best for you. You aren't. They had issues. Satan and a third of the demons were kicked out of heaven. They'll never go back. They'll never have God's blessing and favor ever again. You and I... Until we die, we can have God's maximized favor and blessing upon us in this life, depending, you know, we might be dying of terminal disease and we're going to die tomorrow, so there's not a whole lot of time to see God's blessings, other than we can have assurance and peace in our heart. If we get truly saved, we're going to be in heaven with God for eternity. We're okay. We're not going to get judged for our sins because I asked Jesus into my heart, become Savior and Lord. He asked forgiveness of all the sins I've committed against him. He forgives us. We are squeaky clean the moment the heart stops. If we're truly sorry that we've sinned against him as much as we're capable of doing. Okay? Now, Satan best operates through deception. Okay? He best deceives us by his lies. Let's take a look at Sister uh, Moore. She believed she was a boy at a young age. There can be various reasons why there was opportunity for one or more demons to brainwash her 24-7. You're a boy. You're a boy. You're a boy. You're a boy. And so with need to deal with this, 
she was enticed to begin to have an attraction for women. Okay? She shares about that. That's very common, my friend. Satan is starting at a young age, speaking to males and females. Males, you're a girl trapped inside a boy's body. What are you going to do about it? Do something, Satan whispers. Or vice versa, in Sister Moore's case, I'm a boy, so what are you going to do about that? Well, God knows that all of us need love. We need emotional gratification. And uh, Satan will send us people who knows exactly what is, is exciting and enticing for us. And so that person will give us emotional gratification to a degree that we're addicted to it. We like it. We may not be getting it from our parents. We may not even have parents. But we are always uh, prone to go to those who give us emotional gratification. Satan knows that. And he takes advantage of that in us. If we're not aware that he's even operating, trying to take advantage of that. Well, then as you grow older and you begin to experience uh, hormone changes and you ultimately begin to question and begin to experiment with sexual issues, um, having sexual gratification with whoever you want to have that with, and it's emotionally gratifying, it becomes something I want 24-7. I want it and I need it and I got to have it. Well, then Satan, you know, he sets us up into those situations as life goes on. And we fail to realize because we haven't been taught or we've yet to believe because Satan has worked so hard at blinding us to the reality. There are demons that God allows in situations where they have great influence into our lives. We can go one further here. I don't want to get too far on it. But once you start giving in to sexual temptations, whether you're having uh, sinful relations in a heterosexual relationship with somebody outside of your marriage, or if you're not married and you're having sexual relations with a man or a woman or both, uh, you're sinning against God because he has clearly said in the New Testament, don't fornicate, don't commit adultery. So if you're single and somebody else is single and you're having sexual, emotional, sexual relationships, sexual relationships with somebody else, you're committing sin against God. And he said you're going to be punished for that. So in the adultery situation, you're having a relationship with a married person, spouse, or both of them this day and age, you're committing adultery. That's a sin. And serious sins, God says. They'll send us to hell if we don't receive forgiveness from Jesus Christ for them with a desire, God, help me stop this. This is not God-pleasing. I know that. Help me stop it. And then be patient about it. He wants you to stop it. It doesn't always just stop the way we want it to stop it or as fast as we want it to stop it, but he will stop it one way or another if we truly want to stop practicing ongoing sin. Now let's just stop here a moment. Being tempted to sin is not a sin. Satan will lie to you and say, oh, you're thinking these thoughts and blah, blah, blah. You've sinned. That's a lie. Till you commit the act, okay, you haven't sinned. Once you've commit the act, you've sinned. God has a dividing line between temptations and committing the act. Satan wants to say, oh, I received this scripture here where if you've lusted after somebody in your heart, you've committed to sin. No, it's twisting what God intends that to mean. We all have temptations, sinful temptations. That's natural because we're born to want to sin. We've covered that. But giving in to those temptations is what God says don't do. And if we continue to practice, engage in one or more ongoing sins, it becomes a very serious issue in that demons can then begin to oppress us and literally possess us to where we're driven and blinded to spiritual truth. We don't care what God has to say about it. And we, our hearts get hardened to what God has to say about it because Satan has got his brain voice saying, I got to have what I got to have, and that's what I got to do to survive. And then justifies, well, God, he wouldn't punish me for this. I'm not an evil person. I'm just trying to find love and gratification and give that to other people. 
And so he's got a myriad of ways to hold us entrapped in one or more sins that can affect our eternity. When we talk about issues of sin that are offensive to God, and that has eternal ramifications on the judgment day and ramifications in that it causes God. God does not bless sin. He forgives sin, but he does not bless it. God does not bless it. We may think he's blessing it in sexual intimacy. Well, that's very short-lived, to say the least. And God, the whole core of Christianity is we're all going to be judged for the sins that we gave place to on the judgment day. And if we are standing into judgment day before the judge, the Bible makes it clear we're going to be judged for each of those sins. We're going to be judged for how those sins affected the lives of other people. This is going to be a huge deal. And God is simply saying, I don't want to have to do that to you. I don't want you to be in that place. I want to forgive you of your sins, but that happens this side of eternity, not after you die. Satan would try to tell you, oh, no, that's a bunch of lies. That's a bunch of nonsense. These fanatical Christians are trying to brainwash you with. And so many people believe that. Oh, there is no judgment day. God would never judge me. I never killed anybody. I never, you know, I didn't do all that. So I'm not a bad sinner. I'm a good person. They convince themselves of the lie that Satan has brainwashed them with. Okay? That sin will not get punished. In other words, truth is not truth in the Bible, as it says. Sin will be punished by God. So we have a choice. We can ask forgiveness for it now, not once we're in the next life. It's too late. God has clearly said, it's appointed unto man wants to die, permanently die. We ain't talking about deathbed experiences or people coming back. It's appointed man to die once and then the judgment. So we're going to get judged as soon as God determines we're going to get judged, you know, after we die. And uh, there's no second chances here. And uh, so, but Satan doesn't want us believing that either. Uh, so anyway, he doesn't want us believing truth. Satan wants us to do everything but believe God's truth as is recorded clearly in the New Testament Bible. God wants us saved from the penalty of our sins now. Because none of us know when our heart might stop beating and then their judgment will come. We don't have any assurance that we've got tomorrow, my friend. Let us not deceive ourselves in thinking everybody else's heart might stop tomorrow, but surely God wouldn't let mine. There we are, deceived again. We don't know when God says, you've had enough. I've extended enough grace and mercy to you. You, don't, sir, you want my forgiveness, but you don't want to change. You don't want to repent. You don't want to repent of your sins. What's that? means God Forgive me of my sins so that they're not held against me on the judgment day. And more importantly, help me to not give in to the temptations when this again rises. Now, this can take a lot of time to get set free from some of these ongoing sins that we've been engaged in for some time. So cut yourself some slack. God does. Uh, but don't trifle with God. He, he is known to give us over to the hardness and the rebellion of our heart and say, oh, that's what you really want to do? Have at it. Pay the consequences. I'm done with you. He will do that in the lives of people. I'm not going to try to entice you to believe truth anymore. You're hell-bent on believing Satan's lies? Then go for it. See where that's going to get you on the judgment day. That's the side of God that we don't want to believe exists, but it is holy and Holy, true. God's a holy God. He's an all-just God. And an all-just God manifests punishment to those who deserve punishment. But that's why he sent Jesus. I don't want to punish you. I want to forgive you. And I want you to be all that I've created you to be in eternity. But if you circumvent that, you go to hell and you spend eternity in hell suffering for the sins that I wanted to forgive you of in your lifetime before you died, 
You're a wasted creation, just like a third of them demons is, you know, there. I don't believe God created any angel or human being to be a wasted creation. But he gave us free will. An all-loving God would do that. But he gives us the freedom to hang ourselves or to jump under the umbrella and stay there of God's favor and blessings. So, you know, I, I was listening there to Sister Moore's testimony. She asked Jesus. She had some knowledge of Jesus from her younger years. And Jesus, take this away from me. Take this away from me. That's very common. I've had sin, strongholds of sin in my life. You know, uh, 35 years I didn't live for God. I wasn't even sure he existed. Then, you know, God miraculously made himself real to me and a transformation came. I got saved and that's been over 35 years now and I'm so thankful for that. But for those first 35 years, I didn't care. I didn't care if I sinned. I didn't care. I didn't care if there was a judgment day. I got to where I didn't care if there was a heaven or hell. I didn't care. I just was so miserable. I didn't care. Well, God saw how much Satan had me trapped, headed for hell, and by his mercy, whacked me up alongside the head with his cosmic baseball bat, woke me up, and transformed me, and I you know, began to try to figure out what's going on, and in time, the Holy Spirit revealed to me, you know, that I was just one more victim of Satan, heading on a course of self-destruction that would affect me forever and eternity, paying for the penalty for my sins. But it took some time for me to get victory over uh, nicotine addiction, alcohol addiction, pornography, masturbation, uh, addictions of various sort, other things that, you know, anger and, and venting anger on people that didn't deserve it. There's a lot of areas that we are so imprisoned by our sinful natures. And God wants to forgive that. So we are free and clean if our heart stops beating at any moment. Okay, so that on the judgment day, we won't be judged for our sins. We will be rewarded for what we did after we truly got saved. So reward day or judgment day is really twofold. Judgment day for non-Christians, those who are not saved, will be their punishment for eternity. For those who are saved at that time, their sins were blotted out as soon as you ask him to forgive you of them. And uh, you do that every time you commit them. Get squeaky clean every time you commit a sin. Do it as many times as you need to. Gets clean. Uh, forgiven from God, so to speak. Not so to speak, just get forgiven by him so you're okay, you know. And then move on. But continue to ask and trust and believe him that you'll be able to say no to the temptations to sin when they arise the next time. Then eventually God will give you victory over those. Okay, if you live long enough. Um, so the bottom line is you need to get saved if you're not. And don't think that this little prayer, well, Jesus, uh, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I receive forgiveness. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. And then just go on as though it's no big thing. You know, in other words, a fire insurance policy. So they don't burn in hell for eternity. You know, I've done that. Did that as a little kid. And live life the devil right after it. Didn't change a thing. Didn't bother me a bit if I sinned. There was no substance to it. I didn't want Jesus Christ to be my Lord is what it amounted to. A lot of people want him to be Savior. But they do not want to let him be Lord. They want to do what they want to do. And they hope like crazy that God will bless what they decide to do. Even to the degree of living in hardcore serious, dangerous sin, and saying, well, I want God to bless me anyway. Or, I don't really care whether God blesses me because this is all I really want is emotional sexual gratification. What more could I want? Because some are so vulnerable to settle for just that. And it's sad. I know I'm speaking some hard words here, folks. This issue of lesbian, uh, homosexual, gay lifestyle, transgender, identity issues and that's what we're really dealing with with identity issues am i a boy am I a girl am i both am i a dog am i a cat am i a serial killer I gotta kill people to satisfy this craving inside of me to maybe get this drive away from me whatever it might be that's driving us um 
These things are causing us to weigh in the balances of God. And he says, get out of that. Don't do that. I'll help you. I'll give you everything you need if you just really, truly want to exist for the reason I created you in the first place. And that is to glorify him. Just glorify God. How do you do that? In alignment with truth. You got Muslims who's trying to glorify God, but it's not in alignment with truth. If they don't change and let Jesus be Savior and Lord of their life, they're going to find out glorifying God better be in alignment with spiritual truth that God backs up, or there's going to be severe consequences to pay for them. So, living your life to glorify God, that's, that's truth, but Satan will say, go do that every way possible, but not to please Jesus Christ and obey his commands in the New Testament. He's going to fight you 24-7 trying to get you to glorify God every way, but in alignment with Jesus' truth, the Father's truth, the Holy Spirit's truth. And let me say again, I share some hard things because it's not easy for me to talk about this all the time, but God truly, truly wants us to have emotional spiritual gratification in our relationship with him that's what he wants because he knows that is the most satisfying and out of that god will bring deliverance to areas of sin identity issues in our lives and one way or another he'll give us the ability to stay single and receive emotional spiritual gratification in our relationship with him or he'll give us a mate a normal mate that will fill that until we get to heaven or until that person dies okay i think i better end it out i've gone too far gone too quick said too much and people can only handle so much Uh, i encourage you to go to the preciousTestimonies.com website and there's many writings on there to help people understand some of the things that we've talked about. Uh, It's not there to provide all the insight to all of these issues, but God has many other Christian websites available. He has local churches for you to attend. You can ask questions. Be very discerning about which one you go to. Be very prayerful and concerning because Satan has many churches who are not operating by the Holy Spirit. Rather, they are wolves in sheep's clothing, so beware. But it's the same thing on the Internet. You can have one link. It will be right on the next one. Sin isn't sin. God God says homosexuality, gay, lesbian lifestyle. It's not a sin. You know, you got, uh, the Bible can't be trusted. It's just one of the books, you know, that will help us. But be careful. Don't believe it is the only source that God has down here on planet Earth for humanity to receive truth. So read some other stuff. Listen, He's got a myriad of ways to try to get us to realize that the Bible is the only reliable, trusted source written that God has given humanity. If we needed anybody else, anything else but the Bible to reveal truth to us and what is pleasing to God until our time is done in this life, God would have given it to us. One source is all he needed to give us. It's our roadmap to pleasing and glorifying God because it is spiritual truth. My friend, I started out with and I'm going to end with, seriously seek God to reveal to you how you are robbing yourself because Satan has helped you rob yourself of receiving maximized rewards and blessings in this life. This life won't matter a whole lot about that, but it will matter after the judgment day. So, Let's do everything and be wise we can to receive God's maximized favor and blessing. We aren't going to get it if we're engaged in ongoing sin. The wise are trying to say no to sin before it's acted upon. Not easy. None of us have mastered it completely as born-again Christians. 
But boy, we should be doing better as the years go by. <laughs> I would think God would say, okay? Thanks for hearing me out. God bless you.